Okay, we, we are now in chapter 7 in the book of Ezra. This is where there's a, a, a turn in the story. This is when Ezra is introduced. After this whole uh, exchange with the king of, uh, with the Persian king, and the adversary is trying to block the construction of the temple, finally getting the, the license again, and building it on the seventh year of Artachshasta, Artachshast, the uh, Ezra is uh, being appointed as a leader for the Jews in Eretz Israel. Some scholars believe that he came to replace Zerubbabel and Shesh Batsar, other, other names that are mentioned, because the other, uh, those other people, Zerubbabel and Shesh Batsar, were descendants of the house of David. And the king, even though he let the Jews in Israel build the Beit HaMikdash, he was concerned about having a leader who's from the David, Bet David dynasty, because that leader might become too powerful and too popular and restore royalty and sovereignty. So he made a transition and <clears throat> appointed a scribe, a scholar who's mainly in the religious field. So uh, Ezra comes with another round of, uh, of immigrants who come to Israel, and he receives a special, uh, a special uh, royal decree that says that not only Ezra can go to uh, to Eretz Israel with followers, but also he uh, he makes a commitment that Ad Kesafki Kirin Mea, Ad Hintin Korin Mea, Ad Hamar Batin Mea, Ad Batin Meshach Mea, Milah Dila Ketav, that the Persian kingdom is committed. To supply uh, the temple in Yerushalayim with silver, wheat, wine, and oil. So this is really a collaboration. They are, they're very supportive, and uh, not only that, he exempts ulechom mehodayin dikol kahanaya velevaye zamaraya taraya netinaya ufalhebet elha. All those who work for the temple kahanaya the kohanim levaye. Levim, Zamaraya, the singers, the Zamar, Taraya, Zamar, Zamaraya is to sing, the singers. Taraya is removed like Shar, Taraya in Aramaic, the gatekeepers, Netinaya, the servants, those who bring wood and water to the temple, Ufalhe, Bet Elaha, and all those who work for the temple, Minda Belova Halach, they are all exempt from the royal taxes. This is a, um, in, in the spirit of the Kohanim of Mitzrayim, already in Egypt, we find that the Kohanim were exempt from giving uh, the 10%, or oh no, sorry, 10% was the uh, uh, homage to, to Parao. This is in, uh, in Bereshit, chapter... Uh, chapter 47 verse 22 he did not buy the land of the priests the priests of, of, of the pagan uh, temples in uh, Egypt remained free of taxes and they, they could cultivate their lands and eat the fruit similarly in the, not exactly okay, not, it's not the same thing but in the, uh, in the system of the Torah Levim and Kohanim don't own their own fields, but they get 10, the ten percent from the people. So there was this there was this idea of the uh, clergy or the or the religious servants being uh, exempt from certain tasks, and then uh, or even getting uh, support from the people. Today, there's this, there's a similar uh, idea in halacha based on that pasuk. It was first. Uh, Presented in the Gemara that uh, that the scholars, the rabbis of the city, are exempt from the tax. Back then, remember, there was a very heavy, uh, burdensome tax by the Roman Empire, and they said they are exempt from it. Later on, people went Jews. We lived in different countries. Each country, each kingdom had its own system, and there was always a debate whether the the scholars, the religious leaders, should be exempt of the taxes or not. Could you rely on it or not? I remember we, we spoke about what happened in Tzafat in the 15th century, 15th, 16th century. 
uh, in Tzifat in Israel. After the glory days of Tzifat at the time of Rabbi Yosef Karo and the Ari and other great scholars, the problem started when the, there were so many scholars and so many uh, students in Tzifat and they said that they are exempt from paying, from paying, of paying taxes. And the Ottoman Empire were collecting taxes from all its subjects. The, um, and eventually, the scholars insisted, and they, they were in charge, so they ruled. They insisted that they are not paying. And the merchants who lived in Tzifat, and they were actually the basis for the economy of the city, said, we cannot take the full burden of the taxes. There are 100 people in the city, and 10 people only pay taxes, so they left the city. Once they left, the economy deteriorated and the city uh, was abandoned by other people. <clears throat> and similarly today, you will see in Israel, in some cities where the majority of the people are yeshiva students, like in Bnei Brak, and they don't pay the local taxes, the city is not well maintained. And there's uh, also an escape. People who work for a living and do pay taxes eventually don't want to live in, 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 in Bnei Brak because they pay for the rest. And all this is based on this pasuk, where it's the, it's the Persian Empire with hundreds of thousands of, or, or even millions of residents of subjects who says we are giving an exemption for those, this small group who serves the temple in Yerushalayim. And that's because they were not, pay, they were not, they were not working? They because they were, they were supposed to be dedicated. To income for the right. Students? Yes. But the idea was that they are dedicated to serve the people mm-hmm. and that's the way we support them. But when it becomes... When, when there are, you have more people who serve than those who are being served, then you have a problem. Um, and also, it had that, even, with, even with the exemption, people have to be uh, realistic and realize it, that, okay, we are willing to, to share the burden in order not to uh, put everybody in the predicament. So this is the, uh, the license that the, the Persian king, king gives Ezra, bring the... The immigrants back with you to Israel. You get the, the support. You are exempt of taxes. Not only that, the Ant Ezra and you Ezra, ki chokmat el ahach di bidach, as the wisdom of God, the, the God is bestowed upon you. Mane shaftin v'dayanin. You are in charge of uh, appointing judges and religious judges. Di lehavon dayanin lechol ama di ba'avar nahara lechol yedai the teilach. You are uh, going to instruct. All the people in your side, on your side of the river, which is Eretz Israel, east of of the of the Jordan. <coughs> so judge according to the laws, and also teach those who don't know the laws. Because in all who will not follow your rulings and the rulings of the Persian kingdom is at the same level. This is a very uh, powerful uh, authority that is given to Ezra by the king of, uh, of uh, Persia. It says, anyone who will not follow, you will do whatever the, the law requires. Whether it's death or expulsion or uh, confiscation of property, or being put in jail. It's a very powerful uh, authority. And he concludes, Ezra, Baruch Adonai Eloi Avotel, Ma Shalatan Kazot Belev HaMelech, Lefeir Et Bet Adonai Asher Berushalayim. He praised God for, give, for, for giving the king that will to, uh, to empower him, both religiously and politically. And in chapter 8, he describes how they all gather, again, by the river, in order to go to Yerushalayim. Um, and then he prays to Hashem to protect them on, on the way, and they travel. They departed from the river called Ahava. Oh, you said they already had the carts in the supermarket selling Ahava products from the, the, the Dead Sea, right? So, so uh, the, on the 12th of Nisan, just before Pesach, they traveled in, probably they kept traveling on Pesach. Maybe stopped only for the holiday, because they saw that as a as an emergency. You don't delay it for the holiday. The moment they were ready, they departed and they came and they uh, and they brought sacrifices in the temple. 
Then Ezra is shocked when he hears the news of what is happening in Israel. Uchechalot ele. After we did all the celebrations and the sacrifices in Yerushalayim, a nice welcome and all that, the the officials came to Ezra and told him, "Lo nivdelu ha'am Yisrael ve'akohanim ve'alviim me'amei aratzot." The people, both the Israelites and the clergy, the Kohanim and the Levim, did not separate themselves from the nations of the land. All the nations that are in the Torah of different levels, the seven nations of Canaan, with whom we're not supposed to to have uh, to marry at all, the Amoni Moavi, which traditionally we don't accept converts from the male males, but do from the women, Mitzri and the Mitzri, Egyptians, that according to the Torah. If uh, Egyptian <coughs> people converted to Judaism and kept marrying within themselves, the fourth generation or the third generation can marry into the Jewish people. But all of them married into the people in, uh, who came back from Babel. Because they, they married uh, their daughters and their sons. And they married their daughters and their sons. And it started with the officials and the ministers. So the, uh, the leaders did that. So if the leaders did that, the people uh, followed suit. When he heard that, he tore his, uh, his garments, he pulled his hair and sat down to the ground, not, not knowing what to do. And then towards the evening, he got up and, and prayed to Hashem, This is a phrase that you know from the tefillah. We said in the Harunim of the, the fast days, Ezra Sofer Amar Lefanecha, this is the source. He says, I am ashamed and embarrassed to even look up to you, Hashem. This is beyond imagination. Our sins have, uh, are be above our heads. <coughs> finally, finally, you had mercy on us to return us to the land, and this is what we do. We are still subjugated to the Persian kings, but how can we how can we even speak now that we've abandoned your mitzvot? And he goes on and on. And in chapter 10, it says, one, when he was, he was crying and confessing and praying, Everybody joins him, and now they're all uh, awakened, and they cry and they pray, and they decide, of course, to... Not of course, but apparently here, um, to to do something about that. So one of the people says, "Anahnu ma'alnu belohenu, v'nashiv nashim nashim nochiot me'ami aretz, ve'ata yesh mikvel Yisrael alzot." He says, "But we can fix it. We made a mistake. We can fix it. What is the uh, what is the solution? How do you how do you remedy the situation?" Ve'ata prayers. But no, they already married. There's a simulation. Fifty percent of the people are married, are intermarried. What? Already married. They're already married. They, oh, the divorce. Like we're going to divorce all, all the foreign women, and send away. Not just divorce. The garish leotzi is to to drive them out of the country, the women and the children. And Ezra stood up and he made them swear that this is what they're going to do. They said. They, they call everyone to come to Yerushalayim. And they say, if you don't come within three days, your possessions will be confiscated, and that person will be put in, in harem excommunication. It's interesting because the Jews that remained in Israel, those were the Jews who didn't leave to Babylon. No, those are the first, the first round of those who came back. No, but the Jews that they found when they went back to Israel, when Ezra went back to Israel. There were not that many who, le- who were left in, nobody was left in Israel. Okay, After the destruction, one, everybody left. No, no, back to the they, 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 right, the first, the first wave. So, so it was just from the first wave. Yes, I see. yes. Okay. Um, Vaikov and it's very uh, immediate, I mean, explicit description of how this happened. Vaikov kol anshe Yehuda uvinyamin Yerushalayim lezlosh daimim. All the people of Yehuda and Benjamin, because only that region was populated by Jews. Uh, 
Yehudan Binyamin is today the area of Yerushalayim, towards Yamamela, that area, the Dead Sea. Uh, so they gathered there, Bahodesh at Teshi'i, Be'esrim Bahodesh, it's the month of Kislev, on the 20th of Kislev, Ve'eshivu kol ha'am b'rhov bet ha'elohim, Mar'idim ala davar, they're all sitting in the plaza in front of the temple, and they're shivering because of the severity of the issue, and also because it was raining. <laughs> it's nice how the Pasuk says it. They were, they were shivering. So you don't know why they're, why they're uh, shivering. And the Zah gets up and he, and he rebukes them. And he says, uh, and they all answer, yes, we are willing to do that. Let us separate. But but we have so many people and now it's raining. And this is not something you could do in one day or two days. So let us appoint uh, people and they will slowly do that. So obviously when you hear that, you realize that they came because of the threat, but they were not really willing to, to follow through because they say, it's raining, it takes a long time, we can't do it in one day, and there are too many people here. But there were several people who stood up and said that uh, let, us, let us enlist everyone, and everybody is listed here in chapter 10, including the Kohanim. Uh, with that, the book of Ezra concludes, because we are transitioning into the book of Nehemiah. Later on, we'll see that uh, it seems like they were trying, they, they, they kept on pushing, driving all the, the foreign women out of the, uh, out of the country. The question is whether it happened or not. From what the, the, the book of Isaiah and Hemya tell us, it seems that they did that. But scholars, historians, went through all the material, whatever we have evidence, uh, came to the conclusion that this probably did not happen. Mm-hmm. And if it happened, it happened on a very minor scale. Because you should think about the repercussions. You have a, a, a nation that just came back to the land. They're there for... 10, 20 years. They got married, they have children, they are surrounded by enemies. But the only, the only connection that they have with some of those tribes who are around them is through marriage. Now, all the women are going to go back to their nations and they say, our husbands divorced us, they kicked us out of the house, or out of the tent. It's going to create war. It would be the end of, of that, of that settlement. Right. Most probably what have happened was that they slowly assimilated into the Jewish people Converted, whether official conversion or not, and eventually this was forgotten. Um, but officially, officially, this is uh, this is a story that we have. There is also one opinion am- uh, among scholars that the the book of Ruth, Megillat Ruth, was written at that time, was written at the time of Ezra, to show that 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 not only one is not supposed to marry into another nation. But sometimes from a convert like Ruth, she is the great, great... But not just convert, because the Moavim are the only right. ones that present the problem throughout the generation. Right. That's the only one Males and females, exactly. Yeah. Right. right. So it's, it's an, so an extreme statement of saying that uh, unlike what Azar wanted to do, this is the reality. So we have this debate. It's not concluded. The same debate is, is, uh, is present today. What do you do when you have uh, when you have couples who are intermarried? Do you tell them to divorce or do do, do you convert uh, the non-Jewish spouse? This is ongoing. Is it the shuvah of Hachamah Bade Yosef? The problem of whether it's she's a Moavid or no, not. No, right. It's not about Moavid right. or not. Yeah. Right. There's an interesting the shuvah of Hachamah Bade Yosef. Right. In uh, it just published just published now in the last volume of Yabi Omer, uh, the eleventh volume. It's a shuva that he wrote when he was a rabbi in Cairo in 1949. So it was a still a young man back then. It was the rabbi. And uh, a woman came to him and asked him to help with the conversion of her daughter-in-law. Her son married a Christian woman in Egypt. And she asked the rabbi to help her with that. So he called the couple and he asked them, he asked the woman, are you willing to, get to, to have a conversion? She said yes. He said why? She said because I want to live with this guy. It's for marriage. 
So he said, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. And he sent them away. He said, there's no way I can do it. Uh, and then the mother came back to him, crying and pleading with him. She said, if, you're not, if you don't do that, I'm going to lose both. I'm going to lose the children. You have to help me with that. And eventually he changed his mind because of that. This is when in early days where he thought that one should not do that. And then he did his research. He did his study. He realized that most of the rabbis of Egypt and other Sephardic countries and, Ashkenaz, and in and Ashkenazi communities had the same approach, same mentality. That even though they would try to fend off people who tried to convert for marriage, but if there already was a bond or marriage or people living together or having children in one way or another, they would work to do the conversion in order to keep them within the fold. So just interesting that we, have, we see today the same reflection of things that went, uh, went on thousands of years ago. But when he told the people, when you ask the question, yes. what would have been the right answer for him to say, okay, I can do it? Do you know what I'm saying? That is an example of, of someone who analyzes a certain source of halakha and says, A, but then when yeah. more factors are being brought in and the personal uh, element is, is highlighted, he says it differently. Yeah. And it Maybe could be because he was a young, he was a young man, right. came from the yeshiva, had a certain worldview, right. right. and all of a sudden he's exposed to a completely yeah. uh, different reality. He realizes, if I'm going to stick to my, like, call it stick to my guns, mm-hmm. we're going to lose hundreds and thousands of people. And that's why he changed his attitude. Maybe he like, would have wanted to, to her to say, I love the Jewish religion, I believe in it, and that's the reason I Right, no, so he said, I'm going to work with, with them until she gets to the point that she says that. I see. Even though we know technically that that's the reason, and it does happen. You have, I've worked with couples where uh, people say, no, one side says, I'm not interested in, in religion at all. Any religion. I'm an atheist. I said, okay, so maybe just you want to see the basics. Give the people, you know, give them books. They end up that that spouse becomes more religious yeah. than the one who was originally yeah. Jewish. So, always a, a positive. Okay. The 666, that's the story of Anata, destroying for things. Well, the number I mentioned before, 656, yeah. that's, that's the time that passed from the destruction of the first temple to the destruction of the second temple. That's otherwise the Antichrist number. No, no, that's 666. That's the name of the beast. Uh, no. No, not related. Baruch Adonai, Le'olam, Amen, Ve'amen.